Thank you, Ambassador Kinley. I mean, what a, what a terrific uh, uh, set of, of brackets, if you will, to hear from the President-elect and to realize that the United States is on this path and now to hear from the world, from the UN. Well, what better way to hear from the world than directly from the representatives that we have gathered here today to engage with you, our leadership governors. And so uh, uh, now let's have the main event and put our governors to work. Let me introduce our moderator for this panel. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to introduce Scott Pelley, who I'm sure most of you have seen as a contributor on 60 Minutes for the last many years. He's received three Emmy Awards for his amazing work. Um, and did one very memorable 60-minute special on global warming, where he literally went to the ice flows and saw what was happening and has, has truly delved into this issue and knows a great deal about it. Uh, he's a remarkable individual, was born in San Antonio, Texas, and attended journalism school at Texas Tech University. And I should mention that he also moderated a similar group of leadership governors uh, from the United States and premiers from Canada at, uh, at Yale University this past Earth Day, uh, where he actually kind of kicked off this process. So there's a DNA or a passing of the baton, if you will, from that effort that was focused on the U.S. to now this effort that is focused on the world. Please welcome Scott Pelley. Thank you very much. So great to be with you today. Governors, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being with us. On 60 Minutes, we've done a number of pieces on climate change over the last few years, and I've had an opportunity as a result of that work to go literally from pole to pole and everywhere in between. And we have seen glaciers melting. We have seen crops destroyed due to drought. We have seen forest and range fires as they have suffered here in California. We have seen those fires growing more intense and more frequent around the world, and we have seen coral reefs bleaching in the oceans. But one of the wonderful things about all of this is that this is a problem so global, so immense, that rarely in human history, perhaps never in human history, has the entire world recognized a problem and taken steps to solve that problem for all of mankind. It is a tremendous opportunity, I think, for the planet at large. Now, we will bring out the, let me call for the rest of our guests to come out. We have representatives here today from India, from China, and from Mexico. And for those of you who have studied today's agenda, you will see that we have what are really the three areas of the world that are of most concern when it comes to admitting greenhouse gases. We have North America, India, and China. So if I could get all of the uh, rest of the representatives of the panel up here, please. Terry, send them on out. Here they come. Let's give them a big round of applause, please. to hear from such important decision makers in various governments around the world on the issue of climate change. Let me just go from my left, your right, across the head table here and uh, introduce each and every one of our panelists this morning. First of all, on the far end, let me welcome Governor Eduardo Boris Castello of the state of Sonora. Governor Jose Guadalupe Osuna Milan of the state of Baja, California. And let us all welcome Arvind Kumar, Commissioner and Permanent Secretary of the state of Sikkim in India. We've already said hello to Governor Jim Doyle and Governor Blagojevich, and I have uh, Governor Sebelius with us here and also Governor Christ of Florida. Let's move on to the People's Republic of China. 
Guangqing Gao, Director General of the Department of Climate Change and National Development Reform Commission. And our Canadian representatives this morning, John Gerritsen, Minister of the Environment in Ontario. And Barry Pinner, Minister of the Environment for British Columbia. A remarkable group of representatives here this morning. Let me start with China. And for those of you who require uh, translation from the Mandarin, please, uh, please don your, uh, your headsets. We're going to uh, begin with a statement from Director Gao, the Director General of the Department of Climate Change at the National Development Reform Commission, essentially the leading policy organization within the People's Republic of China. Minister Gao, if you would, sir. Uh, Thank you, uh, Chairman, uh, California, and the governors of the various uh, states, uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, I express my uh, gratitude to uh, Governor Schwarzenegger for inviting us to uh, participate in this uh, Governor's Global Climate Summit. First of all, allow me to express my condolences to the recent uh, fires in California and also express um, my uh, true condolences to the victims of these uh, fires. I am very happy today to have the opportunity uh, to introduce to everybody here uh, China's policy measures and actions taken and outcomes obtained regarding climate change. I would also like to make a few proposals on international cooperation to address the global climate change. China is one of the countries that, one vulnerable, that are vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. We should pay attention to the three aspects of the fact regarding the emissions of GHGs in China. First, China is a developing country. China is in the process of industrialization and modernization with unbalanced social and economic development between urban and rural areas among different regions. The quality of the Chinese people's lives are not, is not high. Currently, China's imperative task are developing the economy and improving the uh, people's lives. Number two is China's per capita GHG emission is comparatively low and is total historical per capita GHG. And number three, China is taking the challenges of more and more international transferred emission because of the professional differentiation differentiation of the world industries and international transfer of the manufacturing centers. No, sorry. I think translation? No sound. I'm not hearing no. the translation. Our, uh, our apologies, uh, Director Gao. Let us, uh, let us catch up to that, that issue. Is there any sound? Are, um, we, are we hearing it now? Uh, and the interpreter is speaking in English. If you hear me, please raise your hands. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Maybe we can bring the volume up just a little more. Uh, Director Gao, please. Thank you. Um, the Chinese government always takes a responsible approach to the climate change, which we are very seriously and made active efforts to address the global climate change. The White Book China Policies and Actions for Addressing Climate Change was released at the end of October of 2008. Following is a brief introduction of it. The policies and measures adopted by the Chinese government to address climate change include, one, we have adopted the China National Climate Change Program, which defines the specific targets, fundamental principles, priority areas, and policy measures to tackle climate change by 2010. 
Two, we have set obligatory target in the 11 five-year program on national economic and social development to reduce energy intensity per capita of GDP by 20% in five years. To ensure the fulfillment of the target, we have broken the target into specific goals for local governments and values for various levels and major energy consuming enterprises whose performance will be assessed. Number three, we lay greater emphasis on advancing the transformation of the economic growth pattern and economic restructuring. Number four is uh, the uh, tremendous efforts that have been made to develop clean and renewable energy, such as hydropower, nuclear power, and uh, rural biogas, uh, by stepping up policy guidance and financial input from 2000 to 2008. The installed capacity of wind power has increased 340,000 kilowatts to 10 million kilowatts in China. The installed capacity of hydropower has increased by 79.35 million kilowatts in to 163 million kilowatts. And um, nuclear power has increased from 2.1 million kilowatts to 8.85 million. Number five, we have deepened the reform of pricing, fiscal and taxation systems in the energy and resources sector. By, by giving play to the steering role played by the government and making the most of the mecha mechanism of market adjustment, we encourage the whole society to conserve energy and resources. Ecological, number six, ecological conservation projects such as protecting natural forests and reconverting farmland into forest and grassland have been vigorously pursued, which have which has increased the country's rate of long forest coverage from 13.92% in the early 1990s to 18.2% in the year of 2005, and the greenhouse gas sequestration capacity of the forest has been further enhanced. Number seven, we have adopted a series of laws and regulations to tackle climate change and have launched extensive awareness campaigns on resources conservation and environmental protection to speed up the building of a resource conserving environmental friendly society. Number eight, we have set up the national leading group to address uh, climate change to guide the endeavour of government departments and local authorities in the area. These measures are paying off last year alone. We shut down many small coal-fired power generators with a total of generating capacity of 14.38 million kilowatts, closed down over, over 10,000 small coal mines and phased out backward production localities with production capacities totaling 4.659 million tons of iron, 36, uh, 37 million tons of steel and 52 million tons of cement. Energy intensify, intensity has been reduced year by year on an increasing fast pace. We are confident that through our unremitting efforts, the energy conservation policy targets in the 11th five-year program will be met. Climate change is a major global issue that the international community follows closely, and it concerns the living environment of mankind and the prosperity and development of countries. Actions need to be taken by all countries according to the principles and capabilities of the common but differentiated responsibilities. Our Premier, Wen Jiabao, made a speech at the Beijing High Level Conference on Climate Change, Technology Development and Technology Transfer, which was held in Beijing earlier this month. He said, at present, the spread of global financial crisis and the obvious showdown, slowdown of the world economy have posed severe challenges to the economic development of all countries and of their peoples. Under such circumstances, our commitment to tackling climate change must not waver and our actions must not slow down. China made following proposals regarding the constant cooperation on climate changes. Number one, first, uh, climate change must be tackled through international cooperation. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCCC, and its uh, Kyoto Protocol have laid the legal basis for international cooperation on climate changes. The international cooperation is critical to tackling climate change and factors such as national realities, development levels, historical responsibilities, and per capita emissions.
Second, uh, climate change must be tackled under the framework of sustainable development. The current uh, climate change is ma mainly caused by the accumulated emission by the developed countries over many years. The developed countries should change their unsustainable consumption mode, significantly reduce greenhouse gas emission, and help the developing countries to embark on a path of sustainable development that is suited to their own natural conditions and strike balance between pursuing co economic growth and tackling change. Third, the principle of common but the foreseeable responsibilities must be followed. The developed countries should faithfully abide by the emission reduction targets for the first commitment period uh, set out by the Kyoto Protocol. At the same time, the, they should effectively honour their commitments under the uh, Bail Roadmap to provide developing countries with, supporting, with support in financing. Number four, um, climate change must be uh, tackled by relying on technical process, progress. Uh, science and technology have a very significant role to play in understanding climate change and effectively coping with it. The international community should step up cooperation in development and transfer of climate change technologies, and they should access uh, the time access of developing countries to advance emission reduction technologies and enhance the global capacity in coping with climate change. Five, practical cooperation shall be implemented. Fund is a critical but weak point to the international cooperation on climate change. The gap is huge to the fund between demand and supply on international cooperation. We shall work together to improve the existing financial mechanism, such as the Global Environment Facility, GEF, to implement the actions sponsored by the ADAPT Adaptation Fund and provide additional financial support to developing countries to adopting themselves, adapting themselves to climate change. Uh, thank you. Director Gao, thank you very much for that. We are enormously grateful that you came all of this way to participate in this conference and to bring your insights and represent the People's Republic of China. Very good to have you with us, sir. Thank you very much. We may be separated by a language, but perhaps we are all united by this urgent issue. And thank you very much indeed. Governor Doyle. Uh, let me tell everybody in the audience for just a moment that uh, some of our governors are going to uh, have to leave us before the uh, end of all of this because there are so many urgent issues that have to be attended to back in their state capitals, as you might imagine. Uh, Governor Doyle, let me, uh, let me start with you for just a moment. You had some interesting things to say a little while ago about the opportunities that are present as a result of these challenges that we all face. What are you doing in Wisconsin today? to try to innovate our way out of this climate change crisis? Well, we're doing two or three things, uh, a whole host of things, but two or three major strategies. First is to really build the uh, research capacity in the state. I see this very much on the model of biomedicine, biomedical, biotechnology. And in Wisconsin, we have built billions of dollars of research facilities uh, around our uh, university and has, as a result, have built a major part of our economy around bioscience and biotechnology. I think that the, uh, we have worked hard, as I know other governors have, to transfer the, the uh, research that comes from our uh, research institutions into the marketplace. And I believe that those same opportunities exist in alternative energy. Um, we are building the Great Lakes Bioenergy uh, Center at the University of Wisconsin. It will be a $150 million research center, uh, and we are building it and working to develop it in a way that it will be designed not only for the pure research, but also with the eye of how we get that research out of the laboratories into the marketplace where it is actually, uh, it is actually um, uh, helping us deal with this problem and doing it in a way that's producing uh, good jobs. In addition, we have enacted a series of uh, tax credits for early uh, stage investment, um, to really develop entrepreneurs and small businesses, the cheese factory I mentioned to you before, uh, another one, uh, I mean, it, we all could have examples of these, but this person who has patented a process, a, a, a surface you can put on your windows that not only help 
shield the sunlight, but actually create energy as the sun comes through the window, energy that you then can use in your electricity, as electricity uh, in your home. So we really we have developed a, a series of, of um, early seed stage tax credits developed uh, to, to encourage those entrepreneurs. And we have established a $150 million fund over the, now, over the next eight years that will go out largely in grants, uh, loans, and forgivable loans uh, to companies that are focused on creating um, uh, uh, new jobs around renewable energy. And that's one of the reasons I applaud uh, 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 President-elect Obama's uh, uh, commitment to major federal uh, uh, money that will come out to really help us develop this. But I believe it's going to come through the private sector. What states can do is set very high standards, and we're a 25 by 25 RPS standard state, uh, and to really build in our great research universities the capacity to develop, uh, to, to develop the, new, um, the, new, the new ideas. Governor Blagojevich, you, uh, speaking of high state standards, you too have committed uh, your state, the state of Illinois, to 25 percent renewable energy by the year 2025. How can you possibly accomplish that? Well, we thank you very much for reminding me of that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, we, we feel we can actually do better than that if we, uh, if we can keep the pressure on and, and, and continue to push this issue. Um, we have a tremendous amount of opportunity in a state like Illinois because we have a lot of uh, God-given resources there. We uh, produce a lot of coal in Illinois and with clean coal technology and the use of technology, making sure it's done in the proper way that's environmentally friendly. Um, we can provide renewable energy and create jobs. We produce a lot of corn and soybeans. We're, uh, I think, second in soybeans to Iowa, and uh, I think we're second to, in corn to Iowa, those Iowans. Um, but because of that, we produce a lot of ethanol. And uh, we've been able to encourage uh, retailers and gas stations across the state of Illinois through tax credits that if they sell E85 gasoline, which is ethanol-based, to uh, cars, they'll get a tax credit. We also provide tax credits to consumers who have flex fuel vehicles, and uh, some of the automakers in the state also are given those tax credits. Um, we have the largest wind farm in Illinois, east of the Mississippi, in Bloomington, Illinois. Um, and so we power a lot of our, our uh, energy through the use of wind, and that's a growing uh, c capacity, and we see tremendous potential to do even a lot more. All of our state buildings in our state capital in Springfield, more than 141 of them, are powered by wind. Um, I come from Chicago. That's a city that's uh, called a lot of things, including the Windy City. People don't realize it's not because of the wind. It's because of the hot air that comes out of the politicians. So we have a lot of wind power from those of us who are politicians from Chicago, but we also have a lot of wind power that we invest and encourage industry to do. And then a lot of the things that Governor Doyle talked about, the things that Governor Chris and Governor Sibelius are working on, and clearly California. We like to look to the West. We always ask our leaders on the environment to look to California for ideas. And uh, summits like this are very helpful to us to come back to our state and develop some of these ideas. Well, speaking of the politics of the matter, the politics of climate change can be very tricky for some of these governors, and for you in particular. Uh, you have uh, not allowed the building of additional coal-fired power plants in your state, and yet your state mines coal. How do you navigate that? Well, you navigate that through low approval ratings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and you just keep doing what you think is right. And, and uh, <clears throat> Um, let me answer that, Scott, by saying very few people have a chance to do what Jim Doyle and Kathleen Sebelius and, and Governor Chris and Arnold Schwarzenegger and I get to do. There's only 50 of us. There are only 50 governors. Nobody in my family ever came close to being a governor. And so when you're given a chance like this, the question is, do you use the opportunity to do things in a meaningful way that will make things better for people, or will you deal with it in a timid way where you're afraid to ruffle feathers or upset people and... and uh, and for me, and I think for my colleagues who are here, we've chosen to, to try to do things with our, our positions. And, and again, as I said in my opening remarks, I can't think of uh, anything more important than trying to build a better world for our, the next generation, for our children. And there's a Native American proverb I talked about last night that says that the environment is not ours. We borrow it from future generations. Some generations before us left us with a world that wasn't as good. Uh, it's our mission, I think, in our generation to leave for our children a better world. And why not do it to make our environment a better place. Governor. Thank you, Governor. Thank you.
Governor Blagojevich said that uh, no one in his family came close to being governor, but your father was the governor of Ohio. Was, isn't that right? That's right. <laughs> That's right. You have also been fighting, Governor Sebelius, a, a uh, rear guard action, if you will, with <laughs> regard to coal-fired power plants in your state. You have not agreed to the building of a couple of very large coal-fired power plants. You know better than most of us that your opposition w will tell you that electric rates are going to go up. These are difficult economic times. How can you prevent the building of these power plants, given the economy that we're facing? Well, Scott, in Kansas, we um, have a rich heritage of uh, being good stewards of the earth, and one that I think our um, citizens take very seriously. The permits for the power plants in Kansas were actually to provide power for Colorado, not power for Kansas. We don't um, need, at this point, additional power. And um, our Secretary of Health and Environment, uh, who's with me here today at this important summit, Secretary Rod Bremby, became the first state regulator in the country to use his emergency powers to, um, uh, in spite of the fact that the EPA had refused to regulate carbon, to say this is an important issue for the health and safety of our citizens and for the health of our planet. And so he uh, denied that permit. Um, the legislative leaders uh, came charging into the session in January of 2008 with a slightly different view and uh, introduced a series of bills which would have stripped the secretary of his authority and forced the issuing of the permit. And uh, we battled that during the course of the last session. Um, I vetoed the bills. The veto was sustained. Um, and so we have uh, a new day in Kansas, uh, a new opportunity. Um, like Governor Blagojevich uh, and Governor Doyle and Governor Christ, one of the things that um, we're trying to do in our own states is educate uh, citizens. And in fact, in this case, citizens are well ahead of their legislators. Um, our citizens are actually very supportive of the decision and understand that even when the legislature is not in session, we have the third windiest state in the country. Uh, so we have this enormous asset in um, prairie wind that uh, runs up the corridor where the Saudi Arabia of wind. And it's an asset that is uh, sustainable, renewable, and clean. And we need to harness that asset. So we thought we needed to do two things simultaneously. Stop the additional... Um, carbon being spewed into the air, but also send a very strong signal to the wind industry that we're very serious about moving in a new direction. And we have a, a goal of 10 percent wind power by 2010 and 20 percent by 2020. We have exceeded our 10 percent this year and are well on our way to uh, 20 percent. So the message is getting out. And most exciting right now, there are five competing transmission projects going on. Uh, one of the statements made by the promoters of the new coal plants was that the only way we would have new transmission capacity is that they would build it, and they would build it to uh, transmit the uh, energy produced by the coal-fired plants. And it turns out that there's a lot of private market interests and uh, in the transmission lines, but again, a coherent national policy that says we're interested in this, some additional help in uh, transmission, a smart grid across this country, and helping states uh, take advantage of the natural assets we have will really accelerate this effort. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lad ladies and gentlemen, I'm told that uh, Governor Blagojevich has to uh, get back to Illinois, as we uh, expected. Governor, I want to thank you for being with us. Thank you for your leadership in the state of Illinois, and we're very grateful that you came to speak with thank us today. Much. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Governor Christ, I cannot think of a state in the United States of America that is more threatened by climate change than yours. You're right. We have about 1,350 miles of coastline in Florida, this giant peninsula that sticks out between the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. Beautiful place. Please come visit it. Uh, <laughs> it's nice and warm in Florida now. But uh, you're right. It, it's, that's why it's such a pressing issue for our administration and why we have seized upon the opportunity 
as, as Rod had described before his departure, that, you know, I don't think anybody in my family came close to being elected governor either. And it's probably the same for all of us except for Kathleen, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a magnificent opportunity when the people of your respective states or your province are kind enough to give you their trust. And we call it a public trust. And I think that when you're given that kind of an opportunity and you realize the impact that climate change could have on a state like Florida, as, as any others, then you need to seize upon that opportunity. A great governor once said that I wasn't elected to mark time, I was elected to make a difference. And I think the people of our respective states expect us at least to try to make a difference. And, you know, a lot of us when we run for office talk about different things that you'd like to do when you get there. And um, I think it's important that if you do have the honor of getting elected and you feel the burden of that, I know that on election night, I'm sure Kathleen felt it, I'm sure that Jim did, and I'm sure Rod did as well, will you feel the weight and the pressure of that trust upon you all of a sudden? And the duty, really is a duty, to perform and to work hard. And in this area, I don't know that there could be many more important, because in addition to protecting my beautiful Florida, I love her with all my heart, is, is the opportunity to also help our economy. I mean, think about Florida. Uh, you know, it is a beautiful place. It is a beautiful state. It is unique. It has the Everglades. We've made some real advancements in Everglades restoration recently. We are, have recently just about concluded negotiations with the United States Sugar Corporation for the state of Florida to purchase over 180,000 acres, almost 300 square miles, of what previously was utilized for sugar production to be able to be utilized instead to restore the natural flow of water between Lake Okeechobee in South Florida and the Florida Bay through the Everglades the way God intended it to be. I'm very, I'm very pleased that we've been able to do that, and I, I think that you know it will help our important industry called tourism. Last year alone, uh, Scott, Florida had 80, over 85 million people visit Florida. That employs an awful lot of our fellow Floridians. It helps our economy. Uh, we obviously need to continue to do that, particularly during these difficult, challenging economic times. And so protecting our environment, addressing climate change, setting these goals and standards, it's so important to a place like Florida. And as you led in, in the... Uh, beginning part of the question, it probably does have a greater impact on a state like Florida than, than any other. My family is four of those millions of people who visit Florida every, <laughs> uh, every year. I Thank hope they're you. voting right. <laughs> let, me, let me come all the way back uh, down to uh, the state of Sonora here and Governor Boris Costello. Uh, Governor, uh, as is the case with, with almost everyone here at the table, I, I know that public transportation is a very big issue for you, and I wonder how that fits for you in terms of, of the climate and greenhouse gas emissions. Well, thank you, Scott. And first of all, let me thank uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor Chris, Governor Dole, Governor Blankovich, and Governor Sebelius for the invitation. And after saying that, and because I think the English of the translator is a lot better than my Spanglish, Let me change to Spanish. Bueno, primero, para, para los sonorenses es una reunión eh, sin duda importante porque, además de ciudadanos del mundo, somos un estado important que tiene summit de because, in addition Estamos to being part que, of the citizens convinced that climate change will first affect our deserts, and that is in Sonora. That is why in Sonora we are so interested in this topic. We ha have had very serious problems these years with three hurricanes in a single year, which is unprecedented. So we are concerned with this issue. We were the first state who signed the Climate Change, the Western Climate Change Initiative. And as part of that commitment, we did the first measurement of GH uh, emissions in Sonora. We're the first state together with Baja California who has measured greenhouse gas emissions. And in this result, of course, uh, one of the main sources was a deficient 
public transportation system with a very significant number of cars in our states who are legally or illegally imported from the U.S. and which are significantly polluting our air. So we set out to improve the conditions of our public transportation fleet to reduce the number of vehicles on the roads and to start measuring these results to also increase people's awareness of this problem. In addition to that, we passed a new law that states whoever pollutes pays. But more importantly than what we have done is what we can do towards the future. Sonora is an agricultural state which can absorb carbon emissions through a good agricultural policy. We are a farming state. We can use biodigesters to absorb methane. We could also capture methane from our byproducts. We are a state that also enjoys a lot of sun as the desert that we are, and so we could have a lot of solar energy generation. And undoubtedly, we have a significant opportunity in ethanol production from algae in our coast. There is a project, in fact, already in Sonora for 150,000 acres to produce ethanol from sea algae. I think that this will be an important project. So instead of seeing this as a problem, we see it as a great opportunity. And so we are very grateful to have been invited to this summit. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Uh, Barry Pinner, Minister of the Environment for the State of British, Co the Province of British Columbia. You told me earlier this morning that British Columbia was, in your opinion, ground zero on climate change. What do you mean by that? Uh, you're right. We are. Uh, when you take a look and you hear that globally, you can expect temperatures to increase by one degree Celsius over the next number of years. That doesn't sound very dramatic. But that change is amplified the further north you move or south you move away from the equator. And in northern British Columbia and many parts of our province, we're seeing up to 80% of our pine forest killed off by something called the western mountain pine beetle. We used to be able to count on cold temperatures in the winter of minus 30 degrees for weeks on end to put a check on that pest. We haven't had those cold winters now for almost 20 years. The climate has changed. And as a result, that pine beetle is moving uh, unchecked across our forest, sweeping across the western continent, in fact. And for many of our rural communities that are dependent on forest products and uh, lumbering, uh, that just means that their economy is changing and moving out from under their feet. So that temperature change is uh, amplified at northern latitudes or southern latitudes, and it has a fall-on effect in terms of what's happening to our river and stream flows. Without the forest there to absorb the moisture and to provide shade for the snowpack in the winter, it melts more quickly in the summer. And we therefore have uh, more rapidly rising rivers and creeks. And so ironically, we actually have a greater risk of flooding initially and then droughts because that snowpack, which normally acts as a buffer in the later summer as a continuing uh, reservoir of water, has already melted more quickly. So we're having both extremes, greater flood threats and greater droughts. The, the pine beetle infestation that you mentioned has become a big problem in the United States as well. Uh, we've had big forest kills throughout the American West, and it's even jumped over the Rocky Mountains, and it's now headed into the American South and Southeast. I wonder, as one of the regions that was affected by this first, how do you mitigate that? How do you come back in and repair the damage, or, or is that even possible? It's very costly. So there are those skeptics who say we should just accept the status quo and not take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because it might cost us, it might mean we have to make a change. I'm here to tell you that it's very costly not to address the problem because we've just launched a $100 million program to try and reduce the impact of the floods that we're now facing as a result of the forest disappearing. And our federal government has matched that with another $100 million. So right there, there's a $200 million direct cost in addition to the economic dislocation that we're facing in many of our communities that were dependent upon those forests. And I haven't even talked about the wildlife issues. We have wildlife migrating north to try and escape the warmer temperatures at a rate that is unprecedented. Yes, the climate's always changed, but it's the rate of change. So last summer, for the very first time ever, mountain lions were seen in the Arctic, uh, in the Yukon Territory. 
That's unheard of. They're driven north to try and find game and to get away from the increasing temperatures and to follow that game as it moves north. It's not, it's, it's, there's no doubt the climate is changing. So in British Columbia, we have taken a number of steps. Uh, we've introduced North America's first revenue neutral carbon tax. Notice I word, use the word tax. I'm glad you're applauding because back home, of course, there are cynics and there are people who say, why should we have to change? And why should we put a price on emissions? Why can't we just keep doing things the way we've always done? And I appreciated the remarks from the governor of Illinois, who's getting some flack perhaps around not allowing coal plants. But I can tell you there's also people who aren't necessarily wildly enthusiastic about putting a price on emissions. But our concept in British Columbia is to tax less of what you earn, but more of what you burn. So we have matched... We've matched all of the revenue that's come in from the carbon tax, which is currently set at $10 per ton of greenhouse gas emissions, with offsetting income tax reductions for businesses and individuals, so that today we have the lowest income tax rates in all of Canada, and that's attracting investment into our province, and it's encouraging people to burn less fossil fuels and to cause less damage to the environment. Thank you very much for that. Let me whipsaw us back and forth from British Columbia to Baja, California, and go over to Governor Asuna Milan. Governor, I, I understand that uh, Baja, California, n neighboring us uh, here in California to the south, is a pretty windy place, and you intend to take advantage of that. Sí, muy buenos días a todos ustedes. Yes, Primero, good. Quiero, uh, Morning, everyone. First, I want to thank Governor Schwarzenegger for his initiative and leadership. We all know that he has been a leader that has pushed to respond to climate change with clear, solid ideas. We are also want to express our condolences to the state of California for their fires and to offer our help to the state of California as we did last year when you had the fire season in San Diego. Our Tijuana, Tecate, and Mexicali firefighters are ready to go whenever you need them. In Baja California, as is the case in Sonora, as my colleague pointed out, Governor Burst, were the only two states in Mexico who already have taken that first step, which is to prepare an emissions inventory. Mexico is not a country that is under obligation in the Kyoto Protocol to meet targets for greenhouse gas emissions. However, President Calderon has also assumed that leadership. And Mexico's leadership has permeated into the international arena. And taking as a guideline these efforts that we see around the world and that we see our federal government implement, in Baja California, we have also implemented clear, concise actions to improve our livelihoods and to reduce the impacts and vulnerabilities to adapt to climate change in the local arena. The first step, as I mentioned, was the emissions inventory, which was done in cooperation with the Mario Molina Center. Mario Molina is a Nobel laureate, a Mexican Nobel Award winner in physics, and together with Colegio de la Frontera Norte, or COLEF, this emissions inventory showed us what has been confirmed here today, and that is that the industry that has the greatest contribution to GHG gases is the energy sector and the end uses of that energy. The next step beyond that inventory was to prepare a state climate action plan. Set plan 
is being drafted by 73 of the top scientific researchers in Mexico from prestigious institutions such as COLA, such as UNAM in Mexico City, and our own local university. Now, what does this plan do? It assesses and proposes strategic, specific actions to face climate change, particularly in the sectors that our neighboring state of Sonora mentioned, in farming, in agriculture, in tourism, in urban development, health, and protecting the ecosystems of our region. So what specifically are we doing? There are two power plants in Mexicali, and a lot of the energy that they generate is exported to California. California purchases electricity, but we have made the decision to grow, taking advantage of a huge potential that we hadn't given importance to before, and that is wind generation in the Rumorosa Hills. If the translator can help us translate Rumorosa, I will be truly impressed. But Rumorosa comes from the sound that the wind makes, from howling. It's called the Howling Hills. And so this has started with a small project, with which will be 10 megawatts. Then next year we will have a 100 megawatt project. And we have the potential for 3,000 megawatts, which is huge. But in addition to that, we are already we have launched an RFP for, for a new power generation project using the aqueduct of the Colorado River using water power, hydropower it's a small 25 megawatt project but that's what we're investing in and we have a huge project which is currently being built in Mexicali also taking advantage of solar energy Q-Cells which is a leading manufacturing manufacturer of a Solar power cells is coming to Mexicali with a 3.5 billion dollar investment. The Mexican government reached agreements with this company to attract that investment. We were competing with Malaysia, I think, or some other country, but we managed to bring the investment to Baja. And our commitment is to generate electricity to be used by the government. It's going to be 60 megawatts of solar energy. So with these three projects together, we think that we have a huge potential for renewables in Baja, both solar and wind energy. The hydro energy will be for used by our own government so that we can match California's commitment to use 20% renewable energy by 2010 so, or by 2020. So we are trying to match what our neighbors here in California are doing so that we can take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our state. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Gracias, Maybe this governador. afternoon when Governor Schwarzenegger is here, you can talk to him about selling some of that power to uh, the state of California. You know, the politics of all of this is, is fascinating uh, to me. After one of the stories that we did on 60 Minutes, uh, Senator Inhofe of Oklahoma, uh, and mind you, my family is from Oklahoma, Senator Inhofe called me out on the Senate floor and, and described me as uh, 60 Minutes uh, resident global warming alarmist. And I, I wonder, Governor, <laughs> I wonder, Governor Christ, if, if you believe, if you have any hope at all, that we can navigate the politics of this so that we don't end up in the kind of impasse that we so often see in critical issues here in America. It's a great question, uh, Scott, and, and I'm an optimist by nature. So, yes, I think we can navigate it effectively. And we, we've had uh, great success in Florida. And I think 
The reason is because we uh, really have faced this issue not as a partisan issue, but completely nonpartisan in fashion. And I happen to be a Republican, and uh, we have in our state Senate and our, our state uh, House, both majorities are, are Republican. And when we embarked on some of these initiatives uh, in our administration, there was initially some resistance to, to doing so by some of my Republican colleagues. But we continued to press on. And with the help of uh, some very earnest and good Democrats on the other side of the aisle, we were able to pass an energy bill in 2008 that really emulated the executive orders that we signed uh, back in 2007. And I think, and I should say, without one single dissenting vote, every Democrat, every Republican in the House and the Senate all supported the change. And. Um, So the answer is yes, it, it can be done, and uh, we're very excited about the progress and uh, having the opportunity to do more with cap and trade, to uh, slow down the utilization of dirty coal, uh, develop more solar energy. After all, we're the sunshine state, uh, wave and uh, tide technology as well as alternative um, opportunities have really, uh, really helped Florida a lot. Thank you, Governor. Now, Governor Christ also has to get back to Tallahassee in a hurry, so we're going to thank him very much for his presence and his participation. <laughs> Governor, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for Scott, being with thank us. You. Thank pleasure. you. Now, before we move on to the panelists that we have not heard from yet, and we will do so smartly in just a moment, I think uh, Governor Sebelius had something to say about this, this partisan divide that we have seen in recent years. Well, I just wanted to um, echo what um, Governor Chris said about being optimistic about bipartisanship. Uh, first of all, at this uh, presentation today and yesterday, there are two Republican governors and three Democratic governors. Uh, the National Governors Association, led by a Republican governor, Tim Pawlenty from Minnesota, took on this initiative, Securing a Clean Energy Future, and again had a very bipartisan group. And you saw in the presidential campaign this year that both Senators McCain and Obama uh, took very aggressive positions on the need to tackle this issue. It was one of the conversations that was had when they met in Chicago uh, two days ago. Uh, work on this issue. I think Senator McCain is very committed to being an ally in the United States Senate. So I share Governor Chris' optimism that this is not a partisan issue, it has to be a national issue. It is a priority for this country, and it's one of the great issues to get beyond seeing ourselves as Democratic states or Republican states or red states or blue states. This is an issue which calls on us to be the United States of America and really move forward in a, in a unified fashion. And I'm optimistic that can happen. Absolute. Governor Doyle, please, yes. Okay, Everybody like wants to get on the bipartisan <laughs> bandwagon, please. No, I have, a, I have a sort of a contrary point to make. Um, I think, unfortunately, it has been a very partisan issue. There, have been, there are good examples of Republicans, Governor Schwarzenegger certainly among them, Governor Christ. But generally, in state legislators across the country, and certainly in Wisconsin, this has been a, this has been a partisan issue. It's not to say all Republicans are one way and all Democrats the other, but when there are legislative bodies that are controlled by uh, Republicans, unless you have a strong Republican governor who sees it differently, it is very hard to get it done. We have a very uh, ambitious uh, global warming task force report that covers the whole gambit, put together by the, the task force had utilities and industry and environmentalists and university scientists and citizens and everyone. I didn't really have a chance of getting that passed our Wisconsin legislature until November when it, for the first time in 16 years, became a Democratic legislature. But I do believe this is going to move very rapidly in the other direction, in the bipartisan way. I think it's clear that at the national level, given what President-elect Obama has said, this debate is really over about where our national politics are going to be on it. And I also want to make, if I could make one other brief point. Um, to me, I've never quite understood why a scientific issue like whether or not global warming is a Republican and Democratic or partisan issue. I mean, to me, it's a scientific issue. And you can have people disagree with the science of it one way or another, but it, it, I could never understand why one party 
sees the science one way and the other science uh, uh, sees it the other. But even putting that aside, I've had, uh, to me, we as a country have an interest in moving to renewable energy whether you believe in global warming or not. In the state of Wisconsin, when people talk about drill, baby, drill, well, we don't have any oil, so drill, baby, drill isn't going to help us any, uh, and it's just going to mean more of our money leaving the state of Wisconsin. But we do have um, biomass, we have uh, uh, ingenuity, we have inventiveness, we have wind, we have uh, increased solar efforts. Those are things that, so even if you don't buy the science of global warming, just in terms of not sending all of our money outside of our state and outside of our country, but actually building an energy uh, uh, environment, I, uh, an energy economy, I, to me, that seems to me to be a totally bipartisan issue as well. I do think you've seen politically this issue is largely resolved with the election of President Obama, and states that don't get on this bandwagon are going to find that they're 15 or 20 years behind uh, in the near future. And, and with all the credit in the world to uh, President-elect Obama, I think things would have been very different under a McCain administration as well. Yes. Uh, there, there has been a, a general enlightenment, I believe, on, on both sides of the aisle on this particular issue. The, the issues of climate change would be challenging enough if the population of the world weren't increasing. But, of course, the population of the world is increasing rapidly. And that brings me to John Gerritsen, Minister of the Environment on, of Ontario. John, you were telling me before we began today that you expect the population of Ontario to grow 3 to 4 million people in the next 25 years. How do you mitigate climate change and accommodate a growing population at the same time? Well, thank you very much, Scott, and maybe I'll take the politics north of the border for a, a few minutes. One of the first things that we did when we became government uh, five years ago, and Ontario has a population of about 14 million people. It's a large province, but about half of the population is located in the western uh, end of Lake Ontario, in Toronto and what we call the Golden Horseshoe area. That has been growing at a tremendously rapid rate, primarily as a result of immigration coming into our country. We expect that to grow over the next 25 years by about 3 or 4 million people. So the way in which we wanted to end the endless gridlock and the ever-continuing sprawl was that we created a green belt around Toronto of about 1.8 million acres of land, of agricultural land and environmentally sensitive land, where basically we just said no more development will take place in this area. At the same time, we also established a growth plan that clearly set out those areas within that area, but outside of the green belt, where uh, growth could take place. So we allocated notionally to municipalities X number of people to, uh, to take uh, care of the 2 to 3 million, or 3 to 4 million people that we expect to come over the next 25 years. Uh, we made Planning Act changes as well that forces municipalities basically to grow along transportation and transit uh, uh, routes, uh, in other words, but with higher densities. We also set forth a very ambitious uh, transportation plan that will uh, include the expenditure of some $17 billion over the next eight years or so with expanded transit lines, about, uh, uh, you know, about uh, 50 different lines, etc. And the other thing that we did in talking about uh, coal uh, energy plants, we have legislated that by the year 2014, uh, we will phase out our coal-fired energy uh, generation, which to Ontario means about a third of the energy what we're doing there is we, we are... Phased out completely. No, no coal generation by phased that out, point. Phased out completely. I should tell you that when we first got elected, we had a more ambitious plan that we wanted to reach that before that time period. That is unattainable. But we feel that through conservation, through renewable energy such as wind power, solar power, biomass and biogas, we can absolutely uh, uh, meet that goal of 2014 we are currently in the process of developing a new Green Energy Act uh, that will bring uh, a new green energy to our province in a much more expedited fashion. It is very much based on the German model. Uh, the, they came out with an act uh, a number of years ago. Uh, these are just some of the areas in which we think that even though we're from a large province, but where we have a concentrated mass of individuals in a relatively 
uh, small area that we can uh, meet our challenges and meet our Kyoto commitments, which would, as a province, we've always said we wanted to meet right from the beginning. Thank you, Mr. Minister. We have saved the top of the world for last. If you haven't been to the Indian state of Sikkim, I recommend it. It is nestled up in the Himalaya. And we have with us the Commissioner and Permanent Secretary of the state of Sikkim, Arvind Kumar. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I have to imagine that way up high in your mountain redoubt, you probably thought climate change would never come knocking on your door. That's right. If you remember hearing most of the participants yesterday who were deliberating on this issue, they all said that it is the oceans which take the first brunt of climate change. Initially, in India, we also were thinking on the same lines. But now we have realized that it's not the oceans alone, but Himalayas as well, they take the first brunt. Rather, Himalayas and the oceans, they're the first ones to take the brunt of climate change. Incidentally, in Sikkim, uh, where from I'm coming, and in fact, I'm representing my Chief Minister, Dr. Bhavan Chamling, who, is, who was supposed to be here, but is indisposed, so that's why I'm here. It's nestled in the Himalayas, and it's the 22nd state of Indian Republic. And the total state lies in the Himalayan region, having 84 glaciers. So, Initially, we were thinking that, oh, well, nothing will happen. And our state, which, is, which has virgin forests and undisturbed regions of forest, will remain like that. But we do have impact of climate change on these glaciers. That's why about a year back, our Honorable Chief Minister, the appointed a glacial commission involving a lot of scientists and the studies are going on. But yes, the preliminary surveys and reports say that yes, there is some impact on that. And since we all know that the Himalayas are the water tower of Asia, which support the rivers, which support about 1.5 billion population in the Asian region, and these Himalayas are the same, which have the largest chunk of ice besides the polar ice. So it's very important to save them. Glaciers are, are, are such an important issue around the world because you would be astonished at how many tens of millions of people around the world depend on them for drinking water. I, I had the opportunity to be up on a glacier in Patagonia in Chile that uh, feeds the city of Santiago, which is a city of five million people. And yet the glacier is receding and receding. It's just a fraction of what it used to be. We used to have a climate model where in the wintertime the glaciers got bigger and in the summertime they got smaller as they melted and, and sent the runoff to various populations around the world. And it was a well-balanced system. But now that's not happening anymore. All, all winter long, all summer long, the glaciers are getting smaller and smaller in most places in the world. And drinking water is going to be a critical, critical issue. Uh, Secretary Kumar, I, I wonder, with, with such an impact being seen in India, what is India willing to do about the problem of greenhouse gases? Well, India is committed to the sustainable growth, to the economic and environmental protection, no doubt about it. But our problems are different. With a billion-plus population, which is about 17 percent of the world population, our emission is currently at about 4 percent of the total emission of the world, which means about 23 percent of the global average. We have 600 million people as on date which don't have the, uh, you can say, the luxury of modern energy devices. 600 million 600 people million do not people, have yes. modern energy yes. in India. And a quarter of the population, say about 250 million, their daily expenditure is about $1 a day. They don't have money. So we have greater challenges for the development. We don't have the luxury of time as that of the developed nations. But still, we are committed to eco-friendly development and sustainable growth. But in, these, in view of these development pressures, development pressures of social and physical infrastructure, we are not in a position to commit to any quantitative restriction on the CSG emission norms. I would like to hear a little bit more about what China is doing to move to the area of renewables. And I mention this because I would like the translator to get ready 
for Director Gao, so I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that. And as I'm going to give Director Gao the last word on all of this. But before we come to Director Gao, and if the translator would please uh, prepare for that, let me ask Governor Doyle and Governor Sebelius uh, this very difficult question. This all seemed so urgent when oil was $140 a barrel. It all seemed so possible when the stock market was flying high. Now the issues for the American people are jobs, and the pressure on the price of oil has collapsed. I think it's somewhere around $60. Uh, President-elect Obama said on 60 Minutes the other night, this is where the American people generally go into a trance, as he put it, and forget that we're dependent on foreign oil. Let me start with you, Governor Doyle. I mean, how do you accomplish these things when most of your constituents today are worried about their mortgages and worried about their jobs and worried about their children's education? And in all of those tough times, the one bright spot is when I left uh, my home going to the airport, it was at 197 a gallon. So in all of this dire and uh, uh, the, the news that people are receiving in many ways in their pocketbook, the one bright spot is that they are actually seeing gasoline come down to levels that, uh, that are giving them a little bit of a break. You have really hit, uh, Scott, I wish I had a, just a really good answer to you, because the, the obvious answer is to say, we're just going to keep pushing forward. We're going to overcome all of these obstacles, and we're going to just keep moving. And uh, that is the answer, but it's a lot easier said than done. I, uh, I think we are, uh, like Kathleen and other governors, I'm now facing, and I know Governor Schwarzenegger here in California, we're, we're facing budgets that are just, uh, we have uh, imbalances in them that nobody could have imagined even two months ago or three months ago. And, and we have to keep the schools going, and we have to make sure people have health care, and we have to make sure that uh, that. We're not letting people out of prisons that have to be there. And there are just all these immediate things that have to be done. Um, and, and at a time when people are sort of not feeling the heat. Uh, but the answer is the answer I gave, I believe, that despite that challenge, we do have to move forward. And I think part of it is our leader, is leadership, and not only by governors, but everybody in this room, to remind people that those same oil companies in those same countries that could ruin our economy by jacking it up to $4 a gallon, as they did in Wisconsin. We've had uh, an automobile plant, plant close, a terrible blow to a community in our state, because when it went over $4, they simply couldn't make the vehicles there anymore. Um, and so we just have to have people continue to remember what that pain was and understand that those same players can do the same thing to us uh, sort of any time they want. And the only way we're going to get that independence is through uh, uh, renewable energy produced here in the United States. Governor, Se Governor Sebelius, how do you convince your constituents? How do you convince your constituents that this should be among their top priorities when they're facing such difficult times? Well, I think the message of green, clean jobs is also a very critical component of this um, effort moving forward. Uh, I think President-elect Obama did a great job on the campaign trail talking about the fact that this is a, an opportunity, an economic opportunity for America, that if we miss it, um, other countries in the world will be way ahead of us. Um, and I think Jim Doyle has talked about um, that same message. So jobs are clearly a part of this. We've got to get Americans back to work. We have the highest unemployment that we've had in decades in this country. And one of the uh, investments that has to be right out of the gate in a new administration is in putting people back to work, making the pivot to sustainable energy futures. So transmission lines and retrofitting office buildings and classroom buildings, uh, putting green roofs on uh, areas, uh, jobs that can't be outsourced, they have to be done right here, uh, ramping up technology development of wind blades and solar panels and unleashing this terrific, I think, entrepreneurial effort that's standing on the sidelines right now because we don't have a coherent policy. Um, there's a lot of capital that has been kind of held off the uh, investment area because America has been giving mixed signals. I'm delighted to have some accelerated 
technology investment in in seeing whether or not we can get to clean coal. But I think we've got to be very clear about the fact it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as clean coal. So let's go figure out if we can if we can make it happen. But in the meantime, we need a bridge strategy which frees us from imported oil, which frees us from uh, polluting our environment, and that's about uh, taking advantage of the assets we have here. And they're in every state in the country. Every state has stuff that could be developed into biodiesel and ethanol. Every state has assets of sun and wind and cheese. geothermal and cheese. <laughs> yeah, Jim can run his state on cheese. Um, we're we're going to use a little other uh, alternatives. But, I mean, I think that it's about jobs, it's about the economy, and it's about continuing not to slip back because we had this – opportunity once before in the late 70s. And as soon as gas prices went down, we, we did other things. We went immediately back to our old ways. And I think we just have to, as leaders, commit ourselves that the future is very clear. It's ahead of us. It's, it's a tough pivot to make, but we're ready to go. Uh, D- Director Gao, it's hard to estimate how impressed the entire world was with the Olympics. It it was, as we like to say in America, the greatest show on earth. Having said that, China is clearly in a leadership position globally. It is clearly going to be a leader on this issue by virtue of its population and by virtue of its innovation. And I wonder what you can tell us this morning about the things that China is doing now to wean itself off of coal and to move into the area of renewable energy. Uh, Thank you. Thank you uh, for giving me an opportunity, and thank you for your uh, appreciation to Chinese Olympics. And the question you asked, I think in China, we have to use uh, uh, to solve the coal problem. Um, Using renewable energies uh, is more difficult than holding the Olympics Games, because China the natural resources of China uh, is mostly, mostly with coal and the oil and uh, natural gas is relatively not abundant. And no matter what the prices of the oil of the world um, go, go up or go down, the Chinese policies uh, indicate that using renewable energies is one of the main directions. It's already a policy of China because China uh, already passed the renewable energy law and in the law to you use the renewable energies it has already given um, policy and lawful protections. So I just mentioned that introduced the developments of Chinese renewable energy plans has been rapidly developing. I just want to give you a data. In Fengdian, uh, using the wind power to in 2006, in 2007, and also the growth rate of this year, the annual growth rate would be is 146% per, per year. So every year, you'll be more than double. So I just mentioned, in 2006 to 2008, the wind energy um, grew more than 30 times. This is mainly because the policies towards wind power energy, um, giving the pricing benefits to use wind to en- generate energy. Of course, in the recent two years, using clean energy, we have given a lot of support uh, that has a lot of things to do with that, to reduce 
the costs of companies to encourage the companies to develop wind power energy and renewable energies. And they have received a lot of support from that. Of course, to grow the renewable energies, there were a lot of obstacles. The main obstacle would be the pricing, the costs, and also the technologies, the lack of technology. For example, if we use the, if we can manufacture our wind power equipment, uh, it will be uh, more than 50% cheaper than if we are using the equipment produced by the Europe. So we would uh, have more economic advantage if we use um, the self-manufactured equipment. So when facing the, the uh, climate change, so we have um, need to have more cooperation with uh, other parties of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Gao. Ladies and gentlemen, what an extraordinary opportunity to have, have North America, to have India, and to have China, the th three leading parts of the world that are going to have to grapple with greenhouse gases, to have them all here in the room at one time. We are deeply grateful to each and every one of you for coming so far and sharing your insight and knowledge from uh, each of the regions. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Let's have a big round of applause for our panelists, please.